So I just wanted to take a moment and thank you all for coming up here for this occasion. That um, I'm excited because I've been hearing a lot about this book for a good long while. Um, as many of you all know, uh, uh, Reverend Eventhaler serves as a church relationship advisor with Lutheran World Relief. His experience in the Missouri Synod as district president of the Southeast um, brings an incredible amount of relationship and understanding of Lutherans uh, to our work here. And, uh, and, and I kind of not only as a friend, but a, uh, an advisor who has really taught me a great deal uh, about the church here in the U.S. Um, this work that he's going to share with us, um, I think, is going to bring to light um, some great teachings of the church that help us understand how Lutherans and how all followers of Christ engage the world in their faith. And so I'm really excited uh, to have Reverend Dr. John Diementhaler sharing his work here with us. So thank you so much. Yeah. You, you know, thank you, thank you so much for for coming here to, to to listen. I want to tell you a little bit, you know, about this book. And there's probably some questions here if, if you've seen it at all, at least on the cover. You know, first of all, there's the question of the paradox of church and world. I mean, what in the world is that? You know, the church is to be in the world, but not of the world. That comes out of the Bible. Jesus talks about that. So being in, but not of, that's a paradox. Two seemingly contradictory ideas, both of which are true. And they need to be held together in tension with one another if the church is going to uh, really carry out the mission to which Jesus calls the church uh, in every age, including today. So H. Richard Niebuhr, who in the world, you know, is he? Uh, one of the most prominent and respected Protestant theologians in America in the 20th century. He has a little bit more famous brother, Reinhold Niebuhr, who is often mentioned uh, together with H. Richard, but I think that probably the superior theologian is H. Richard Niebuhr. And he wrestled with this paradox of church and world throughout the course of his career. And in fact, he really broke it down into five different types of relationship between the church and the world. If you've read his book or know of his book called Christ and Culture, he sets forth these five different types. So he's got, first of all, the two extremes, a church that uh, becomes so much of the world that it becomes a worldly church, the Christ of culture, and you've got a different kind of church, the other extreme, that does not want to get involved in the world in fact, you know, trashes the culture, sees the world as a place not to be, and seeks to isolate itself from the world, a separatist kind of group, the church against the world. And then he came up with three mediating types that don't go in either or sort of direction, but in a both and kind of correct uh, direction, and uh, you know, three different mediating types. One which is found in Roman Catholicism, one that's found in Lutheranism that talks about two kingdoms, and then the Reformed or Calvinist version of the relationship between the two which he tended uh, to, to, to favor. So <clears throat> that's what really is his contribution to American Protestant the theology. So why this book? Well, first of all, I've spent kind of a lifetime working with H. Richard Niebuhr because he was the subject of my doctoral dissertation, which became also the basis for a book that was published by University Press about him. And uh, this is sort of a collection of his writings from over the course of his career. And I got inspired, I got interested in doing this because Beginning in the late 80s and, and, and the 1990s, there was, con there was conflict about uh, his ideal types of the relationship between the church and the world, Christ and culture. In fact, there were some pretty high profile academic people who said he's obsolete. In fact, in terms of what he wrote, he's done a disservice 
uh, to the church. Well, with that bombshell, there were people who came to defend him, and then there was another group of thinkers or theologians who tried to fix it for the 21st century. So I said, we ought to have a book that lets him speak for himself in this regard. And the more that I thought about this, uh, I came to the opposite conclusion that H. Richard Niebuhr, in terms of what he said about this paradoxical relationship between the church and the world, that this is not irrelevant, that this is not obsolete, that it is in fact very relevant to this sort of post-church age in which we find ourselves today in North America. And I really was helped with respect to this in terms of some, um, some key books of the 21st century that deal with the millennial generation in America, uh, people who really want nothing to do with the church or at one time were part of the church but uh, are no longer a part of it, and what they're looking for in terms of a church. And uh, uh, this generation today is not looking for a church that isolates itself from the world because the world is a bad place. No. This generation wants to embrace the world. It makes a difference in it. On the other hand, the same generation is not looking for a worldly church. That is, that's made up of people who just kind of behave just like everybody else in society, whether they go to church or not. Huh? They're looking for a church that is going to challenge them to be different, even as they seek to make a difference in the world today. Well, that's the paradox. Church and world, a church that is in the world, but not of the world. And so Niebuhr, I believe, deserves a place at the table of conversation as we seek to make our way in this post-church age of the 21st century, and hopefully this book will uh, help that process. So that's why I put it together. Well, what's in this book anyway here? Uh, first of all, uh, a variety of his writings. You know, because he was a theologian, he, you know, there, there's some of the stuff that he's written that's pretty dense. <laughs> and you wouldn't want to read it necessarily late at night. <laughs> On the other hand, there are, there are other things that he wrote, um, you know, essays, sermons, uh, some unpublished lectures that he gave, some things, uh, you know, that, that, that what he wrote in a denominational setting, some things that he wrote for a more general audience. So, for example, there's an unpublished lecture included in this that H. Richard Niebuhr gave at Valparaiso University in 1959. John Nunes, who is there now, just loves this. It's called Martin Luther and the Renewal of Human Confidence. It's very prophetic, actually, because what he says in this is, could be said today. Martin Luther came along at a time when people in that society had lost confidence in all institutions, including the church, or especially the church. And Luther was the one who came along and said, well, your confidence is to be found when you look to God. And what he says to us uh, through his word. So a variety of his um, <clears throat> uh, writings are included in this. And also, secondly, from all periods of his life, people who have studied Niebuhr, they ignore the early part of his life. first part of his life, he was in a, his own denomination, as teaching at the seminary, the president of one of its colleges, the Evangelical Synod of North America, it's the United Church of Christ uh, today. And then he went on and spent, uh, you know, about 30 years altogether at Yale University uh, at the Divinity School. People tend to ignore the early part of his career. I give a lot of attention to it in this book. And things that he wrote with respect, the insights that he gained with respect to the relationship of the church to the world are very existential. In other words, they came forth in response 
to things that were happening in his own time, both at home and abroad. And he lived through kind of an interesting and challenging time, uh, the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression years, and World War II, and, his, and its aftermath as well. So just to give you uh, maybe just one example, uh, of what he said in light of what was going on in the world around him. World War II. You know, what was the church to do with this conflict that engulfed uh, the whole world? The United States at war in the Pacific and in Europe as well. And, and, and Niebuhr spoke kind of like Abraham Lincoln, saying that the, the role of the church in all of this is not to look for signs and confirmation somehow that God is on our side and to demonize our enemies. Rather like Lincoln, he said, we ought to see that we are on God's side, which for him meant looking at the whole conflict from the standpoint of what God has revealed to us through his son Jesus Christ and to see this war as a divine drama involving sacrifice on the part of many people, the suffering and death of the innocent, just as Christ, the innocent one, was crucified and died on the cross, all for the sake of remaking and redeeming the world of all nations, both the allies and the enemies. So just the final thing that I just, uh, you can ask me some questions if you like. But just, I want to say, how does this relate uh, to the work of Lutheran World Relief? And, and a couple things. First of all, Niebuhr helped me, I think it helped a lot of people to see that God is at work in this whole wide world of ours through Jesus and the commitment that he made, that God made through Jesus to come here from heaven to earth, to live here, to die here, to rise again. God is saying that he's at work in this whole wide world and that the direction in which things are moving, the trajectory that we're on, it may not look like it at times, is redemptive. And therefore, God is using all manner of people, secular as well as religious, in order to accomplish his redemptive purposes. And this is LWR. You know, we're ready to partner with anyone, you know, secular or religious, in order that that partner might help us accomplish what we are after redemptively in this world. Namely, to help people get out of poverty and to alleviate the suffering and to combat the injustice that, some, that so often comes with an impoverished way of life. We call that accompaniment and working with partners and I believe <clears throat> that this is a model for the 21st century church in North America, including the Lutheran church. Uh, we're living in a post-church time. Years ago, when it was Christendom, the church time, the church could uh, sit back and wait for people to come to the church, come to church. And this is where their faith would be activated. This is where their faith would be strengthened. And this is still true uh, to some extent. The only problem is that less people are coming to the church. So <clears throat> the better strategy for the church in this day and age is to go where the people are. Because there are a lot of people out there who are secular, who are non-church goers, or who are turned off by the church who are seeking to make a difference in the world in 
one place or another or one way or another. So may not the better strategy for the church to be rather than waiting for people to come, but to go where these people are and to join forces with them where they are in seeking to make a difference in the community and in the world. And it is through that kind of connection that people can perhaps begin to see that there is a reason to be part of the church in this day and time. So, and I've said this to Daniel many times, is that uh, one of the reasons that I'm here at Lutheran World Relief is because I believe in the mission of LWR. The mission, and I say this wherever I go, is the mission of LWR isn't just aimed at people who are the victims of some international disaster or people who are living in poverty. It certainly is that, but it's not just that. The object of our mission is also the church here at home, particularly you as Lutherans. Because through what we do, and the model that we present, uh, we have an opportunity to breathe some new life into the church right here in this country, the church of which I am a part. So that's what I have to share with you about this book. And maybe you have a question or two about it. I don't know. Yes, sir, yeah. So you mentioned um, various uh, examples of upheaval that were going on um, during Niebuhr's life, uh, Roaring Twenties and World War II, the Great Depression. And if we just think of recent times, we have the Great Recession. We see huge movements of people displaced by conflict and uh, climate change and other conditions. And so is, is it just a cycle where it's, it's always some crisis and all of the, the writings of Niebuhr apply and are constant? Or do you think if you were alive today, you might change some of his views and, and have different things to say about what's going on and the, the role of the church in this world compared with the mid 20th century? Well, I think the short answer to the question is I, I think he would say much the same thing. So what I have in this book is somewhat of a lengthy epilogue in which I, in part, imagine what he would say to the church today. So, yeah, and it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's not just uh, in terms of there being some kind of a, of a major crisis, although, you know, we seem to go from one to another, at least <laughs> in the 21st century. Look, think of what was going on right now in terms of the terrorist threat but I think of him, you know, like in terms of the 1920s, which was a, was a more peaceful uh, time. Um, and, 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 and on the one hand, here he was, was in this kind of German immigrant denomination, kind of like mine, the LCMS. And he's seeking to push it into the mainstream of American life <coughs> to make a difference uh, in American culture rather than being an isolated German enclave uh, of, of a church. And he embraces the social gospel. The gospel suggesting that God cares about and God helps people who can't really help themselves, or people who are disadvantaged, members of the working class, you know, in that time. But at the same time, what's going on is that there is a rising middle class. People who are the beneficiaries of the Industrial Revolution in America. So there is electricity in every home. There's radio, tele telephones. Uh, people can drive their own cars. You know, believe it, there was a time. One that was not, uh, you know, that, that, that kind of thing, that this was available. And that you could go and you could experience mass entertainment. You could go to the movies, you know, kind of thing. So this rising middle class 
that perverted the gospel and said, God helps those who help themselves. So if you go, you know, that's to become a worldly kind of church. You know, that's, that's to fuse um, Christianity with middle class culture. So saying, you know, the church has to step back from that and, you know, share what is the real gospel of Jesus Christ with people, which they may not want to hear, you know, in some instances, but uh, it needs to be done. So, you know, that's, that's sort, of a, sort of a peace time and, you know, materialism and so forth. Uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the other side of life today.